Whenever you see the word worship in the Bible, I guarantee you, the intent of the peoples is never fundraising. But the intent of peoples is a loss of something precious. You know, so because we've used this term for so long, you know, it has lost its significance. For example, most of us, we had the word worship in a church setup. Most of us, we had the word worship for the first time. It was in a church service. And the first thing that happened was, was singing. Even worse, a slow song. <laughs> and you concluded. You came the following week, they said, it's time for worship. It's time for worship. And the first thing that happened was singing. But because you're smart, then you concluded that it's worship when it's slow. But once it becomes fast and it has an upbeat, then it's praise. You see what I mean? Because, because of the culture of how we do church. You know, you said that the bed, you, you, you read us. You read us. Oh, every time they say worship, slow. When they say praise, fast and loud. Worship slow and soft. That's why in most religious gatherings, when you do worship, or you ask me to lead worship and I get here, and they say, You are Alpha and Dome. You're like, No, 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 no. They said worship. <laughs> they said worship. And you're making us to praise. You said, Because every time we think praise or worship, we're thinking fast or slow. So, a general believer's understanding of worship is not in line with the Bible. But the problem with that, the problem with that state is that there's only one way to worship the God of the Bible. It's not the denomination way. It's not even the personal or preference way. The only way to worship the God of the Bible is the Bible way. Is the way the God of the Bible has revealed in his Bible. There is nothing else you can do to impress God outside of this book. There is nothing else we can do to impress God outside of the Bible. Anything else that we attempt that is not biblical or scripturally based is not impressive to God. This is what it says. It says what you suggest it ain't good enough. I've got something better than what you think as God. And the Bible says his ways are higher than us. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So worship is indeed the most practiced and yet misunderstood. Because every religion claims to worship God. Yes, they do worship, but the question is, are they really worshiping God? I love the scripture that you have from worship. Because when Jesus introduces that of worship, the first thing that he, he deals with, he deals with the misconception of worship being linked to location. And he said, no, worship is not, is not premised upon location where you are, but it's premised upon relationship. Oh, God help me, watch it. When Jesus teaches us worship, he does not refer to the object or the recipient of worship as God. Because according to the Bible, we praise the Lord, God. But we don't necessarily worship God, we worship the Father. Now, this is Jesus speaking. According to biblical studies, everybody else who wrote scripture, they were just expressing their understanding of God as mankind. But when Jesus speaks, that is not even Jesus speaking, it's God speaking through Jesus. That's why everywhere Jesus speaks, the words are written in connotations and the ring. Because when Jesus spoke, Jesus said, The things that I say to you, it's what I had the Father say to So Jesus, every time he, he refers to, to, to God as the recipient of worship, he does not use the word God. He used the word Father. He says, a time is coming and now is where the true worshippers will worship the Father, not God. And that Jesus is intentional with this technology. The Father, why? Because the premise of worship is a relationship, not religion. The premise of worship is relationship, not religion. It's not the fact that you never miss the service. No. 
But it's the question, do you know the one you worship? That's why to the Samaritan woman, he said, the woman raised a question. She said, our fathers worship on this mountain. So they were worshiping. But you Jews claim it's in Jerusalem. Jesus said, watch, watch, watch. Before I even tell you which is the right place, let me fix your posture. He says, you worship what you know not. So you can come to Kev service every night and never miss there. And yet in God's register of worshipers and never be present. Because you never miss a service, but you don't know the Savior. Therefore, let me close that into that story. Therefore, unless you are born again, you can never worship the Father. Because there's only one access to the Father. John 14 says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the not God, the Father, except through. So for you to worship the Father, you must come to where He is. But there's no one who comes to the Father except. So unless you are born again, you can never worship God. Yes, you can praise Him. But you can never worship. And this is another thing, this is another thing that I want to deal with today before I get on to responding to, 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 to the brief I was giving. That worship is not necessarily the most important part of the savings. That is a misconception also. But worship is the premise of the entire savings. You see, in the church, our language, our terminology is causing more confusion for new converts. Another misconception is that in the church, we refer to those who lead us in worship, we refer to them as worshippers. <laughs> the worshippers of Kef. Question, if these are worshippers, what are you? <laughs> There's a lot of chaos in the church. And Hannah says this, worship is the most practiced and yet misunderstood. I'm even being chillers when I say misunderstood. It's the one that we're most ignorant of. If these are worshippers, then I'm worried. What are you? I know you won't say it, but let me tell you, we have become spectators. That's the reason why time and again when we leave so-called worship gatherings, we have comments like, I didn't enjoy worship today. The worship team did not do it for me today. Oh. <laughs> okay, I, 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 don't, I don't have an English expression for this, so let me do this soon. I am fire me more yet. I'm not catching I'm not fire. I'm not doing it at all. I'm not fire. I'm not fire more yet. You see, that is the language of fans and spectators, not participants. As a man of biblical truth, biblical truth, none of us has any right to comment about worship. None of us. The only being that has a biblical or legal right to comment about worship is God. Because it's meant for Him. To that point, how dare you expect to enjoy a gift that is not addressed to you? When we say you are Alpha and Omega, we're not talking to you. Maybe your name is Alfred, but you said you are Alpha. So don't get it twisted. So the only one who has the right to comment about worship is God, the recipient. Our job, all of us put together, the congregants, the musicians, our job is to make him enjoy it. Amen. Even the concept of wanting to enjoy worship is unbiblical. I've done a study of worship for the past. 15 years of doing the research of the worship, I've come to this conclusion that in the Bible there is not even one worshiper that enjoyed worshiping. In the Bible, there's no one worshiper that enjoyed the activity of worshiping. They never enjoyed the activity. 
but they enjoy the benefits of the activity. Not the instruction to do the worship. That is never enjoyable in the Bible. And then I wonder, when we come from so-called worship night and say, oh, I had a good time. What is it that we are doing that we call worship, that the Bible worshipers did that was not enjoyable for them, and it is so enjoyable for us? One of my friends said, when we live tonight, we understand what worship is about. And he said, worship is not about being enjoyed, but it's about being enjoyed. They never enjoyed it, but they enjoyed. Because worship, according to scripture, it's never nice to the worshiper. It's only pleasurable to the one you worship. In this activity of worship, the one who gets pleasure out of the encounter is not the worshiper. It's the worshipped at the expense of the worship. And there was no amen. Amen. I love it when you're like this. Now, let me tell you. There's so much that I... One of the things that I struggle when I have to teach on this is, Lord, what do I leave out? It's not what do I say. It's what do I leave out? Because there's so much... This is one subject that we can't do picky picky mabelan. We have to know what it's about. And for, for, for tonight, let me... Let me base my, t- my, my, my presentation on two pillars. Normally, I'll base on three pillars. One is to confront traditional misconceptions. Number two is to consider the biblical presentation. Then number three is to use the biblical evidence to establish, what is that? to construct a scriptural application. Because worship is not what we do on weekend, Sunday morning or Sunday evening. But worship is the life that we have to live on a daily basis. As a matter of fact, worship, I have a thesis that I'm busy with. That worship is the mother as the life. And this life gives birth to three Ps. Prayer, praise, and prostrating. So the life of worship must be expressible in these three forms. Prayer, praise, and prostrating. And everything else that we do comes from these three Ps. Prayer, praise, and prostrating. Let me explain this. Remember that as a man, you are a tripartite being. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. So if worship is a way of life, then worship must be expressible in all three aspects of mankind. It can't just be your amor and prayer. It's a spirit. But when we look at your physicality, there's no worship there. When we look at your soul, your psychology, there's no worship there. If worship is a way of life, your way of life is spirit, is soul, and body, right? So if worship is a way of life, it must be expressible in all three dimensions. Otherwise, then it's not a way of life. It's something you visit. If, it's a way of life, if it is a way of life, it must be expressible in your spirit. It must be expressible in your soul. It must be expressible through your body. Because that's how life is expressed. So prayer is the function of your spirit. No wonder Paul in Romans 8, 26, he says, The spirit of the Lord helps us in our witnesses, for we know not what to pray as we ought. So the Holy Spirit is not helping your soul. He is a spirit. No wonder John 4, 24, the one of she read, it says God is a spirit in being. And when you worship him, you worship him in your nature that is made in his likeness. So it must be spirit to spirit. That's where prayer kicks in. Praise is the function of your soul. No wonder David says, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Not spirit. You don't praise because of say moye. You praise so you can be a moye. So prayer is the function of your spirit, man. Because prayer is communion with God. Praise is the function of your spirit, not of your soul. No one says, bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. What is all that is within me? I'm glad to ask. The soul has got three elements. It's the mind, will, and emotion. 
So David says, when you bless the Lord, your mind can be absent. <coughs> you can't be thinking about God at Kef and thinking about Ushara Ilembe <laughs> Eka. Then you are blessing the Lord, but not in all that is within you. You wonder why sometimes God never inhabits our praise. Because it's mindless praise. We just go with the motion of the proof. No wonder he says, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within you. Meaning when we praise God, your mind must be in the praise. No wonder he says, forget not with what you will remember. The mind. So the mind, the will, who? The will is the problem in praise. The reason why sometimes when you read praise and there's no maximum participation in the house, it's not because the worship team has no oil. No, it's because your will is not willing to dance before the Lord. The problem is not the groove, the problem is in time, oh yeah. Yes, you are at church, but you just don't want to dance that much today. Because somehow when you look over your life, you don't see the goodness of the Lord. You think you woke yourself up this morning. That's why there's no reason for you to say, Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Your emotions. There's no way you can say, Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You're saying something and then you're expressing an opposite emotion. I'm so grateful. <laughs> so thankful. No, you have to bring your emotions into it. So praise the function of your spirit. Praise the function of the soul. Prostrating is the function of your physical body. Romans 12 verse 1. I urge you therefore in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. How is the sacrifice offered? It's prostrated on the altar. So that when your flesh demands unrighteous things, let, let it burn. You don't burn the flesh, you burn the desire. No wonder he says in 2 Corinthians, he says, Don't you know that your body is the temple of the, of the Lord? And the Holy Spirit dwells in you. So if the body is the temple, then your body must do what the owner of the temple wants to do with it. Every time I get to the temple, I, 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 I laugh because you find, especially, especially as the young ones, you know, you say, you know, you know pastors, pastors must just stop by trying to control us with our bodies. This is my body. I can do whatever I want. I can go wherever I want. I can drink whatever I want. I can sleep anywhere I want. You know, but when this body gets sick, because of your whatever you want. <laughs> when this body gets sick, what shall we do? The Bible says the body is the temple of the Lord. And the Lord says, no, it's my body. It's in my own simple one. I can do whatever. But when it gets sick, then here you are, you know, it, it, in your bedroom, you say, Lord, this boy is your temple. <laughs> and I ask myself, first if you are busy, we are tempered. We are tempered. But I'm so glad I'm seeing you come and say, Lord, this is your temple. <laughs> so you must decide, you know, do you want to temper or is the temple of the Lord? Decide which temple is it. Make up your mind. <laughs> if it's the Lord's temple, then she just one. If it's your temple, your temple is going to bring you to your knees when you're looking at Lord, this is your temple. Heal me, Lord, not for me, just for you, oh God. And God knows that, no, 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 no. This, prayer, this prayer is not, this is not sincere. You want me to heal you because it says my temple, then you go and you temper and you temper. <laughs> so these groups, they remind you, you can know you temper, that's a lot, you temper. It's preaching too, you just don't get the message. <laughs> Quick, 23 minutes. Let me deal with the misconceptions. There are, there, there are a lot of misconceptions around the subject of worship, but let me deal with this few. The first one I want to confront tonight is that worship does not begin with worshippers. Worship does not begin with worshippers. In the, in the encounter of worship, worshippers are respondents, not initiators. We are respondents, we, are res we respond, we don't initiate. That's why the notion of I worship God the way I want is unbiblical. Because the way you want must have been triggered by something you like. And you hear some believers in your worship things, they say, Ishmael, the worship team doesn't sing that song that I like anymore. Yeah. <laughs> hey, 
Ni washiki ya sasa tu yeye. Amina tu sasa ni mzozo washiki ya sisi maeti ni tayi yeye. Ni amani tu kuri sasa ni mzozo washiki ya sasa ni full time basis. Man is boni. And brother, I'm coming to you. They're saying this. Chachi, why have you never seen my song? I'm like, when I see your song, when am I going to see his song? Because we think worship is about us. I worship God the way I want. No. You don't worship him the way you want. You worship him the way he treated at you. Not the way you want. And sometimes we worship him as we, we, we fall into the temptation that our ego wants to see what we like in the congregation. Come on, everybody, lift up your hands. <laughs> what if you are triggered not to lift your hands, but to bow your knees? Yeah. Then you have to leave what the Holy Spirit is inspiring you to do what I like, so I can feel good about my performance. So our task as worship leaders is to, is to align the congregants to God's trigger and let them respond in the way that he made them. Because we're not the same. We don't have the same personalities. Sometimes we want people not to do... You know, some of them, they're not there. They don't have it in there. At any given time, you abandon who you are to mimic what I do. You have lost the authenticity of your praise. Because now we are copycat. God knows how He created you. He knows when you extrovert. But all of a sudden, when you come to church, you act intro. Hey, God, what's wrong with this product? <laughs> You're not functioning, man. So the first thing is that worship does not begin with us, it begins with God. Number two, worship, although it begins with God, it does not benefit God. It benefits worship us. Amen. Meaning when we worship, we're not doing God a favor. You're doing yourself a favor. There's somebody tell you when you join for, Jesus asked her for a drink. Not because he needed the drink. But he saw how much she needed the drink. That's why in verse 10, the Bible says, Jesus said to her, If only you knew the gift of God. And who is asking you? You would have asked me, and I would have given you living water, not distilled water. You've come to draw the water from the well. I've got better water for you. Meaning, and to teach us a principle, every time God commands you to do something for Him, it's not because He needs it. He sees how much you need. It. So Jesus was saying to her, She already had the living water. Actually, Jesus knew she was coming. That's why he sent the disciples away. The preceding test, the Bible says Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Jews never went through Samaria. But Jesus needed to go through. Why? Because he had divine appointment. So when Jesus said, give me a drink, he already had living waters. He said, give me a drink. And she thought she's going to do Jesus a favor. She said, you are a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. There's no deal between us. Like some of us, when God commands us to do something for him, we think we're doing God a favor. And yet the command is the revelation of your need. Listen, ladies and gentlemen. The command does not benefit the commander. It benefits the commander. It's for your benefit. So number one, what she doesn't begin with, Worshippers, it begins with God. Number two, it does not benefit God, it benefits worshippers. Let me deal with, with, with this third one. Worship is not the songs we sing. Now, the songs we sing are a means, are one of the means to express it. But the song by itself is not worship, it's a song. For example, when I say you are Alpha and Omega, it's not worship. But it's a medium to express my conviction. But the song by itself is not worship. It's a means to an end. The song you see, we call them worship songs. Or put it that way, it's a song of. It's a, the song is of worship, but the song is not. The word of simply means there's a relation between the song and the source. So you can sing your alpha, but if that alpha is not bad for 
on your conviction of him being answered, then that's just after him or man. It's not worship. What makes it worship is where it comes from. For example, I've got two daughters in my home. Teresa and Teresa. Teresa and Teresa, they are churches daughter or daughters of. So, there must be something on them that looks like me. This is the reason why you've got shows like Likunud. Because somebody is trying to ascertain if it's this child of mine. So if this child is of mine, there must be something of me that is traceable on the child. So if there is no DNA of worship in your song, then the song is not much of worship. It's just a song. Therefore, as music ministers, we should be full of worship first before we decide on which songs to sing. We don't pick and choose songs to sing in the service because of what's trending on one gospel. That's why it's not every song that's trending out there that must be sung here. Yes, the group is nice, but some of the songs don't even align with the vision we just read. So we are comforting with our group what we're trying to teach with our preaching. So the song by itself is not worship. What makes the song worship is the premise. It's the source. Come on. Therefore, when you look at my girls, we don't say, I look like them. That's wrong. They look like me. That's why I want to say to worship leaders, songs don't have worship. Songs express the worship of the singer. If the singer is not a worshiper, there is nothing in the song that can cover up for that absence. That's why a certain song when they're sung by certain people, it's just a nice beat, nice tune, nice groove, it ends there. And yet the same song sung by somebody else, it triggers you. Because, let me tell you this, to finish that. Songs, there is no such a thing as a powerful song. Then this is the thing that powerful song. That is the religious misconception. Songs don't have power. Songs only express the power of the use of the powerlessness of the sin. That is why when we share songs on one gospel, we like it, we learn it with the team, and we come on TV the song has power. But when we come to care. Someone somewhere in the previous generation came with a strong song on 
concept. Because mankind struggle working with things they can't define. Yeah. We want to define everything. We want to put the red tape on everything. Yeah. So God never defined what or she is. He left it open. This is the problem I, this is the problem I have with us religious, different religious denominations. Where you see other people when they worship and you say they're not worshiping correctly. Yeah. When you want to worship, come to my church. It's <laughs> a worship, but it's not God. I don't know why all the women they go, see our sheep, all of them, that's what this expression. It's our sheep, but we go deep. If you want to experience worship, let's come to our church. And the point, yours is right based on what? What's the instrument? And then most of them, they'll mention props, not worship. They say, our song. That's not worship, that's performance. Yeah. Our parents is tired. That's not worship, that's performance. Yeah. We've, got the, we've got great singers. That's not worship, that's performance. Actually, you are gloating about an instrument, not the activity to worship. Yeah. So God never defined worship, and which is a problem for us. The Bible does not define what worship is, but it describes how worship must be offered. Who must worship? Whom ought to be worship? Where we should worship? Why we worship? It does not tell us the what. It does not define it, but it describes it. I, had, I asked the Holy Spirit throughout my study. I said, why do you never define worship? Because most of the divisions we have in denominations is because of preference of worship. Oh, I'm telling each other people's issues now. Denominational differences, the premise of is how we prefer to worship. Yes. We want to wear uniform in our worship. Yeah. You all want to come with tonchins. So the tonchin generation, the three piece, the samba, others who want to hold the stick, it's just props that divide us. Because all of us claim to worship the same God. It's a matter of position. It's where we are. It's not who we are worshiping. We are blinded by what we prefer. And we have missed what he has prescribed. So we need to go to the first mention. And here, when the word worship appears the first time, what does the Bible say? So we can understand what worship has to do with. Amen. Now, quickly, turn with me to Genesis 22, verse 5. I'm closing with this. Genesis 22, verse 5. If I had time, I would show that in the Bible, people have been worshipping God way before Abraham in Genesis 22, verse 5. But the word worship does not appear only up until Genesis 22, verse 5. And there are three people I want to draw here so that we can have a glimpse of what worship is about. Amen. The Bible says, He said to his servants, Who? Abraham. Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. He said, we will worship and we will come back to you. So this is where the word worship appears for the first time. There are quite a number of observations that we can draw from this. But in the interest of time, let me draw three. The first thing that we observe is that when the word worship appears for the first time in the Bible, it did not come out of God's mouth. It's Abraham who's speaking here. So we could say, Abraham is the one who coined the term worship. God only used the word worship for the first time in Exodus chapter 3. When he was talking to Moses on the burning bush, he said, God tells us to let my people go, so they may worship. Aha. Uh -huh. So when God used the word worship in Exodus 3, he was not coming with another idea. He was borrowing what Abraham established. The principle of first mention teaches that anywhere in the Bible you find the word for the first time. That's where you must zoom in to understand or to discover the definition or the description. Because the Bible does not contradict itself, but it interprets itself. So other uses of worship after Abraham are trying to explain or interpret what Abraham established. For the scripture we read in John. Jesus, when he said, a time is coming and now is where the true worshippers will worship. When Jesus used the word worship, he was not coming with a different doctrine. He was trying now to practicalize what Abraham theorized. Stay with me, I'm closing. 
In Romans 12 verse 1, when Paul says, I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This is your proper act of worship. Paul was not coming with a new doctrine. He was interpreting what Abraham established. The question is, what did Abraham mean when he said we will worship? If you don't understand the inception of the concept, you will run with misconception throughout your life. So any given time you have, any time you have a problem or a challenge with the biblical subject, always look for the first mention. Where did it start? Because the first mention will give you its pure state. For example, issues of marriage. The case we have today, it can be solved. Not by marriage counselors, by going back to the origin. The first mention, Genesis, it was between a man and a woman, male and female. Everything else is our case. It's our preference against his prescription. And look at the church we have in the nation. It's the same with worship. Because we lost the first nation. We have all this chaos we have in the body of Christ. So church, what did Abraham mean? So the first observation is the word worship came out of Abraham's mouth. He's the one who coined the term worship. If you look at verse number 2. Because this was not Abraham's idea, it was God's idea. Verse number two, the Bible says, Then God said to Abraham, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains. I will show you. Proof. This worship did not begin with Abraham, the worship. God is the one who killed Abraham. Because worship does not begin with worship. The offering of Isaac was not Abraham's great idea. Abraham did not see Isaac and say, Hey boy, follow me. Where are we going? I'm going to burn you today. <laughs> this was not Abraham's idea. If worship was to begin with us, God will never get what he deserves. Yeah. Because if Abraham was to come up with what to worship God with, there's no way Abraham could have offered Isaac willingly. Yeah. He had to be commanded. That's why I said, if you understand worship, worship is not pleasant to the worship. Offering your Abraham had a problem banishing Ishmael alive. Where do you think he has the desire to offer Isaac? The Bible says, when Sarah said to Abraham, chase this woman and his child and her child, the Bible says Abraham was distressed. If you are distressed by chasing away, I don't see you enjoying killing it by yourself. That's why God had to call, has, God must command us to worship. Because there's no way we will willingly do it. To his standard, that is. That's why God must command us to give tithes and offering. Because there's no way you will willingly transfer 10%. It's a struggle while you are commanded. I'm wondering how will it be easy if you were just given the privilege to do it from your heart. We'll be sending 2.5%. He will understand and say, well done. And God doesn't understand. So number one, Abraham is the one who coined the word. Number two, Abraham used the word worship as a camouflage. Meaning when he said, we will worship to the boys, they did not understand what he meant. That is why when somebody says, I'm a worshiper. So, what do you mean? When you say you're a worshiper, you have not said anything. The only thing that qualifies your claim is when I see your behavior. A lot of us will stand here and say, but when I'm not here to perform, I'm here to worship. I'm not here to perform, I'm here to worship. And then, why do you claim that you are a worshiper? Actually, your claim must align with your behavior. Because if what you mean that you are a worshiper is that you sing slow songs, you sing slow songs on Sunday, but you don't live a life that is pleasing to God during the week, then you are not a worshiper. So Abraham used the word worship as a camouflage. Look at your Bible. Genesis 22 verse 5 was supposed to be written like this. Look at your Bible, I quote. When he said worship, he was camouflaged in verse 2. He took all that is in verse 2. And he compressed it in one way, worship. Because God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. Go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. Verse 5, Abraham, boy, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. 
oh, I can't tell you what he told me in verse 2. So I must find a way I can use to come up with this truth. We will worship and come back. What, what if you are supposed to say? Stay here with the donkeys. I'm taking my son, my only son, whom I love, Isaac, to sacrifice him on this mountain. Because God told me, when I'm done, I'll come back to you. That was too much information to teach you principle number two. That your worship is not by its concern. You don't owe anybody an explanation why you worship the way you do. You don't owe anybody an explanation why you cry in his presence. They don't know how he kept you. They weren't there when he saved you. So when you worship God, you don't even have to mind what they think about you. Because what the Lord is telling you is between you and him. Principle number three. The reason why he said stay here with the donkeys. To teach me that in the place of worship, spectators are not welcome. In the place of worship, they must stay with the donkeys outside. As a close, don't allow the people you came with to rob you the presence of the one you came to. Don't allow them. Learn to tell people. Yes, we came together, but stay here with the donkeys. <laughs> stay with the donkeys. There's no way I'm going to miss the presence of the Lord because I'm afraid of your eyes. <laughs> Last principle, and I close with this one minute, 18 seconds. Number one, Abraham, the word worship is coined by Abraham. So, if we claim to worship, the question is are we doing today what Abraham meant then? Because if what we're doing is not the same activity as his, not in the keeping of sons, but in the motive and the posture of the heart, then what we're doing is not worship according to scripture. It is something, but not worship. So, Churchill, what did Abraham mean when he said he will worship? 40 seconds. When Abraham said, stay here with the donkeys, the boy and I will go over there, we will worship. When Abraham said we will worship, he did not mean we are going to sing slow songs. No, he meant I'm going to kill what I love. In obedience to the one I own. Therefore, the place of worship is not a place of singing, but it's a place of slaughtering. And you must kill what you love. So the worship has to do with your willingness to lose what you love in obedience to the one you claim to honor. Therefore, if nothing dies when you worship, you have not properly worshiped. That's why then Paul in Romans 12, he explains it. He says proper worship is when you offer your body as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. He says this, the offering is your reasonable good or is your proper. So proper worship has to do with you losing what you love in obedience to the one you claim to own. Why what you love? I'm glad to ask. Worship is God's way of testing that do you love me or you love the things I give you. That's why for some of us, proper worship is not you coming to jump in the service, but it's you parting ways with those unrighteous friends. Because here you are dancing here. God says to you, this is not the worship I requested from you. You want to give me what you want, but not what I've asked for. And you run the risk of the fate of King Saul when God sent him to Amalek. God said to Saul, go and destroy everything. And Saul, when he got there, he had ideas. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. Just give me, just give me two, two minutes. Saul had ideas. That no, man, the fat ones. Let me kill the fat ones. And it's in the account of Saul in Amalek where we learn the hindrance of worship. Ladies and gentlemen, the hindrance of worship is not inability. It's not that we can't do this difficult thing. It's not that we can't live a holy life. 
It's not that you can't switch off Netflix and read the Bible. It's not that you can't sacrifice all the things you want to buy and be a blessing to the work of the Lord. The hindrance of worship is not inability, watch it, but it's unwillingness. That's the hindrance of worship. It's not that we can't. Guess what? We just don't want to. For example, let know that the evening service is, 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 is a bit convenient, you know, because it started at 6 p.m. You know, but the morning services, some just start at 9 o'clock in the morning. And at quarter to, quarter to 10, you still see people walking in the street. <laughs> 9.45. It's not that you can't make it at 9. You just don't want to. It's not that you can't. You don't want to. It's not the issue of ability. It's the issue of unwillingness. It's not that we can't go to missions. You don't want to. Hey, did you see that coming? Man? It's not that you can't. No, you don't want to. We have missions. I now be busy studying. When we leave, you're not studying. You are where you want to. The hidden of worship is not inability. It's unwillingness. It's not when the song says, we lift up our hands to you. It's not that you can't lift up your hands like this. You just don't want. God is just not worthy. He hasn't impressed you enough to trigger your willingness. Even now, it's not that you can't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You don't want to. If there's one thing that we have lost when it comes to worship chair, is that we have placed worship in the realm of ability. And it is not there. God is not looking for your ability. There's nothing in your strength that can impress God. He's looking for your willingness. No wonder he says, if you are willing and obedient, and obedient, not if you are able. Ability comes from him, it's the anointing. If you can avail yourself, you'll be shocked how much ability you have. I mean, 2015, I said, yes, Lord. And in seven, seven years, I've written 21 books. And yet before that, I never even wrote an essay. <laughs> but my willingness aligned me with God's ability. And now I'm doing things I never thought I could ever do. I was glad when this other guy, my brother, when he came here, he said, your willingness to serve will open you up to God's ability. It's not that you can't serve in the leadership. Yeah.
make Lazarus tall. Lazarus, come forth. The man came. He spent five minutes with the five loaves and two fish. Bring it to me. Father, I dare you. Break it. Miracles. But when he was faced with Tetra Man, those 50 seconds and five minutes prayer did well. He needed three sets of one hour. When Jesus was raising Lazarus, he did not need prayer better. He did by himself. But when he was facing Ketaman, he begged the disciples, please pray for me. Why? Because he was facing his will. It's the hardest thing God has ever given me. It done. The whole, the water watching Jesus. The blind eye opening Jesus. The dead raising Jesus. Making prayers. Oh, if something is wrong with his teaching, it's because now he's confronting the will. He must finally do the will of the Father with his life. He went on his knees. He prayed until his sweat became blood. Because there's something in the flesh that does not want to die as a worship. It's not that those friends have been there for you in bad times. Is that your will does not want to part with them? And Jesus on his knees, listen to his prayer. He said, Father, what you are asking of me, scam this beat. Nevertheless, that's the heart of the worship. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. That's the heart of the worship. Not my will, but your will be done. Guess what? After Jesus prayed that prayer, Jesus died in Gethsemane. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus did not die in Concord. No. He died in Gethsemane. When he said, not my will, but your will, that's when Jesus died. This is the reason why, great point. When they whipped him, he never said a word. Because they were beating a dead corpse. When they made him, he never said a word. Because they were nailing a dead man. When they placed a crown of thorns, he never. Who keeps quiet when they keep women with dead men stripes? Only a dead man. This is the reason why when people gossip about you, you are the loudest to speak. It's because you are still alive. You are easily offended. By the weeping of the people, by the nailing, when they go, when they criticize you, I'm living, care, I'm living, I'm living. I can't stand for this. It's because you're still alive. You have not died. You think this organization is here to make you happy, and we are here to serve the will of the Father until you die to yourself. You will never experience the divine power of the Lord. And the heart of a worshiper. Is in everything, not my will, but your will be done. And if God will give us another time, I'll come back and teach on that biblical, that practical application. How does it look like on a daily basis? Every day when you wake up, the first prayer you pray the worship is that, Lord, I don't know what you have for me to do today, but today, not my will. Your will wants to, your will wants an eye for an eye, but not your will. His will be done. Kote kota. Tit for tet. That is the will of the flesh. So that's why every morning you must drag the flesh to get a man. Every morning you drag the flesh to get a man. When you come back from, from the classes, you drag the flesh to get a man. You say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. My left hand be done for that. Not my will, but your will be done. Just before I sit down, the Bible says it is the will of the Lord for every man to come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen. That there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So before you say not my will to your desires, your behavior and stuff, you have to say not my will to control of my life. Amen. And if you are here, you are going to accept Jesus as the Lord and Savior. As, as your dictator, as your ruler, as your controller. It will be my pleasure tonight, before I sit down, to introduce you to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So if you're here tonight and say, I'm not born again, I've never received Jesus as my Lord Savior, would you lift up your hands tonight and I want to pray with you tonight. So you can start the process of worship. Is there 